This new star, I must know. Tell me his name. The Mongol Empire was one of the most formidable empires in history, known for its unparalleled military prowess and ruthlessness, with which it conquered vast territories across Asia and Europe. Central to the dominance of this great empire was Genghis Khan, a legendary leader whose tactical genius transformed a group of nomadic tribes into a global superpower. However, the legacy of the Mongol Empire extends beyond just its conquests and territorial expansions. From public executions to the use of biological weapons, here are hidden grim secrets about the Mongol Empire that are not known by everyone. Birth and childhood of Temujin. Firstly, let's talk about who Genghis Khan was and how he became a legendary leader. Born around 1162, his birth name is Temujin, and his birthplace is thought to be near the Onan River, in what is now northeastern Mongolia. He was born into the Borjigan clan, one of the many Mongol tribes that roamed the steppes. His father, Yasuge, was a chieftain of the Kiad tribe, a sub-tribe of the Mongols, and a respected warrior. Temujin's mother, Hoelun, was originally from the Merkit tribe, but she was abducted by Yasuge, a common practice in the violent, tribal warfare of the time. The name Temujin was given to him in honor of a Tatar chieftain whom his father had recently captured. His early life was filled with hardship and tragedy. When he was around nine years old, his father arranged a marriage for him with Berta, a girl from the neighboring Konkurat tribe. As was customary, Temujin was sent to live and work with Berta's family until they were old enough to marry. However, on his way back to his own tribe after visiting his future wife's family, Temujin's life took a drastic turn. His father, Yasuge, was poisoned by a rival tribe, the Tatars, who sought revenge for past conflicts. Yasuge's death left Temujin, his mother, and his siblings vulnerable. The Borjigin clan, fearing retribution from their enemies, and seeing no strong leader in Yasuge's young children, abandoned the family. Holun was left to raise Temujin and his siblings alone in the unforgiving wilderness. He and his family lived in extreme poverty, surviving on wild fruits, roots, and whatever small game they could catch. It was during these years that Temujin learned the harsh realities of life, the importance of loyalty, and the necessity of strength and cunning to survive. He also began to develop a deep hatred for betrayal and disloyalty, traits that would define his rule in later years. Even as a child, Temujin exhibited qualities of a leader. He was fiercely protective of his family and showed a natural ability to inspire loyalty among those around him. However, these traits also led to conflict within his own family. Temujin's half-brother, Begter, was older and sought to assert his dominance over the family after their father's death. Tensions between the two brothers escalated, leading to a pivotal moment in Temujin's early life. At around the age of 10, Temujin and his younger brother Kassar ambushed and killed Begter. This act of fratricide was not just about asserting dominance, but was also a means of protecting his mother and younger siblings from Begter's overreach. It was a ruthless decision, but one that solidified Temujin's position as the head of his family and marked the beginning of his journey toward leadership. Marriage and Alliance with Berta to solidify his position as a leader, Temujin married Borte. However, the early years of their marriage were marked by turmoil. Shortly after their union, Borte was kidnapped by the Merkit tribe, one of Temujin's enemies. She was held captive for several months before Temujin, with the help of his blood brother Jamuka and the powerful Khan Togrul, rescued her. During her captivity, Borte became pregnant, and this pregnancy cast a shadow of doubt over the paternity of her first child. Yochi. Despite the uncertainty surrounding Jochi's paternity, whether he was the son of Temujin or a product of Berte's time in captivity, Temujin accepted Jochi as his own without question. This act was significant for several reasons. By publicly acknowledging and raising Jochi as his son, Temujin demonstrated his loyalty to Berta and his commitment to the unity of his family, despite the possible dishonor or doubts others might have harbored. This decision also showcased Temujin's strategic mind. By embracing Jochi, he ensured that no internal division could weaken his burgeoning power base. 
the birth of Genghis Khan. Temujin's early experiences of betrayal, struggle, and survival shaped his worldview and his approach to leadership. He understood that to unite the Mongol tribes and create a powerful nation, he would need to be ruthless, strategic, and uncompromising. Over time, Temujin began to attract more followers, and his influence grew. He established a reputation as a just leader who rewarded loyalty and punished betrayal without mercy. In 1206, after years of warfare and consolidation of power, Temujin succeeded in uniting the Mongol tribes under his rule. During a great assembly known as the Kurultai, he was proclaimed Genghis Khan, which means universal ruler or oceanic ruler. This title signified his authority not just over the Mongols, but over all the peoples he intended to conquer. With this new title, Genghis Khan embarked on a campaign of conquest that would see his empire stretch from the Pacific Ocean to the edges of Europe. Public Executions Genghis Khan was notorious for his brutal methods of dealing with enemies, often using public executions as a means to instill fear and maintain control. His approach to warfare and punishment was marked by a ruthless pragmatism, ensuring that any threat to his power was swiftly and decisively eliminated. These executions were not just about removing a rival, they were about sending a clear message to both his enemies and his followers. Loyalty was rewarded, while betrayal or resistance was met with uncompromising violence. One of the most telling examples of this was the fate of Bori, a former Mongol wrestler who had once bested Temujin before he rose to power. Bori was a well-known and respected wrestler within the Mongol tribes, and in his youth, he had wrestled against Temujin's younger brother, Belgute. During this time, Temujin was still an ambitious but relatively powerless young man, far from the feared leader he would later become. Bori's victory over Temujin's brother was a source of pride for him, but it also planted a seed of resentment in the young Temujin, who would not forget this humiliation. Years later, when Temujin had risen to power and become Genghis Khan, he sought to settle old scores and solidify his authority. Remembering the earlier defeat, he called for a rematch between Bori and his younger brother. However, this was not just about the sport. It was a calculated move by Genghis Khan to publicly humiliate and eliminate a rival who had once embarrassed his family. During the rematch, Bori once again proved to be a formidable opponent. However, Genghis Khan's intent was clear from the beginning. This was not going to be a fair contest. After the match, regardless of the outcome, Genghis Khan ordered the execution of Bori. He instructed his younger brother to carry out the killing, turning what was initially presented as a sporting event into a deadly display of power. The same fate was for his shaman named Teb Tengri. Teb Tengri was a powerful spiritual figure in the Mongol Empire, and his influence extended deeply into the political and personal spheres of Genghis Khan's life. Teb Tengri attempted to exploit the deep bond between Genghis Khan and his brother, Kassar. Kassar was a skilled warrior and a loyal supporter of Genghis Khan, but Teb Tengri saw an opportunity to sow discord between the brothers and elevate his own standing. Claiming to have received a prophecy, Teb Tengri warned Genghis Khan that Kassar would betray him and attempt to seize the throne. This prophecy, however, was nothing more than a calculated lie designed to drive a wedge between the Khan and his brother. Initially, Genghis Khan was troubled by Teb Tengri's prophecy. The idea of betrayal from within his own family was a terrifying prospect, especially given the Mongol Empire's reliance on tight-knit familial bonds. However, despite his initial concern, Genghis Khan's keen intuition and understanding of human nature led him to suspect that Teb Tengri's prophecy was not genuine. Instead, he began to see it for what it truly was, a manipulative ploy by the shaman to gain more power and influence within the empire. Genghis Khan's suspicion was further fueled by Teb Tengri's increasing arrogance and the way he began to assert control over others within the empire, behaving as though he held power equal to the Khan himself. Recognizing the danger of allowing such a powerful and manipulative figure to remain within his inner circle, Genghis Khan decided that Teb Tengri had to be eliminated. The death of Teb Tengri was swift and brutal, as was typical of Genghis Khan's methods. The shaman was killed in a public and humiliating manner, 
But it was not only Genghis Khan who ordered public executions. His successors and other Mongol leaders also performed them. Guyuk Khan, the grandson of Genghis Khan, was one such ruler. He became the third great Khan of the Mongol Empire in 1246, following his father Ogaday Khan's reign. Guyuk's rule, though brief, was marked by a continuation of the harsh methods established by his grandfather. He also publicly executed his brother's wife after suspecting her of poisoning his brother. She was tortured until she confessed, then killed, showcasing the brutal justice system that persisted in the Mongol Empire, even against members of the ruling family. Segregated Feminism Also in the Mongol Empire, the concept of feminism as understood today was virtually non-existent. Instead, women were often treated as spoils of war, symbols of conquest, and commodities to be inherited or exchanged. While Mongol women had certain rights within their communities, especially compared to other cultures of the time, their status was still heavily dictated by the patriarchal and militaristic nature of the empire. When the Mongols conquered a territory, the women of the defeated population were frequently taken as part of the spoils of war. These women, regardless of their previous status, were often distributed among the Mongol warriors or given to high-ranking officers and nobles as rewards for their service. The concept of marriage in this context was less about mutual respect or partnership and more about ownership and control. Women became the property of their new husbands, who often viewed them as symbols of their victory and power over the conquered people. Moreover, in the Mongol tradition, when a man died, his wives and concubines could be inherited by his male relatives, such as his brothers or sons. This practice, known as leverate marriage, ensured that women remained within the family or tribe but it also meant that they had little to no agency over their own lives. A woman's fate was largely determined by the men who controlled her, whether through conquest or inheritance. Despite these harsh realities, it is important to note that Mongol women, particularly those of noble birth, did possess some influence within their own communities. They were involved in managing household affairs, could own property, and in some cases, even participated in decision-making processes. However, these rights were limited and largely segregated from the broader male-dominated sphere of power and warfare. For the majority of women in the Mongol Empire, life was defined by subjugation and survival. Their identities were tied to the men who claimed them, and their fates were shaped by the violent conquests that expanded the empire. Blood Oath and Rituals Blood oaths and rituals were a deeply significant aspect of Mongol culture, particularly during the time of Genghis Khan. The Mongols believed that by sharing blood, the individuals involved were becoming part of each other's lives in an unbreakable way, creating a bond that could not be easily severed. One of the key rituals involved in blood oaths was the mixing of blood between the participants. This would typically be done by making a small cut on each person's hand or arm allowing their blood to flow into a shared vessel or directly onto an object of significance, such as a piece of cloth or a ceremonial cup. The blood was then sometimes mixed with alcohol, often kumis, a fermented mare's milk that held cultural significance among the Mongols. The participants would then drink from the shared vessel, symbolizing the internalization of the bond and the mutual commitment to the oath. These oaths were often made in secret, away from the eyes of those not involved and were considered more binding than written agreements or spoken promises. The secrecy surrounding blood oaths was crucial. Breaking such an oath was seen as a severe offense, not only against the individuals involved, but also against the spiritual and ancestral forces that were believed to witness the ritual. The consequence of breaking a blood oath could be death, as it was thought to bring misfortune or divine retribution upon the oath breaker. The importance of blood oaths in Mongol culture cannot be overstated. They were used to cement alliances between tribes, ensure the loyalty of generals and warriors, and even to seal important decisions within the ruling family. Strong body odor. In modern society, body odor is often seen as something unpleasant and to be avoided, with countless products available to mask or eliminate it. However, in the Mongol Empire, body odor was perceived quite differently. It was not only accepted, but also revered as a sign of strength, power, 
and spiritual closeness to the gods. The Mongols, particularly during the time of Genghis Khan, held a deep belief in the sacredness of nature and the elements. Water, in particular, was considered a divine gift, often associated with dragons, which were revered as powerful and mystical creatures. The Mongols believed that the dragons imparted a unique and sacred quality to water, and therefore, water was not something to be wasted frivolously on activities like bathing. Instead, water was reserved for essential uses, particularly for the horses and for rituals, rather than for personal hygiene. As a result, regular bathing was not a common practice, and the natural body odor that developed over time was viewed as a mark of spiritual favor. The stronger one's body odor, the closer they were thought to be to the gods, especially the dragons. This belief system inverted what we now consider a social norm, where body odor is undesirable, into a marker of status and divine connection. In the Mongol Empire, a warrior or leader with a strong body odor was seen as more powerful and spiritually attuned. It was believed that the gods favored those who carried the natural scent of the earth and their own bodies, untainted by the dilution of excessive washing. This view of body odor was deeply ingrained in their culture and daily life, making it a normal and even desirable aspect of existence in the Mongol Empire, despite how strange it might seem by today's standards. Skull Pyramids Another chilling practice in the Mongol Empire, following the conquest of a city or the defeat of an enemy, was the construction of pyramids made from the skulls of their enemies. This grisly tradition was not only a method of asserting dominance, but also a powerful psychological tool designed to instill fear in those who might consider resisting Mongol rule in the future. After a battle, Mongol warriors would collect the skulls of the slain and methodically stack them into large pyramids within the conquered city or on its outskirts. These skull pyramids were often placed in prominent locations where they could not be missed by anyone passing through. The pyramids varied in size depending on the scale of the battle, with some being truly massive, containing thousands of skulls. The creation of these gruesome structures was a regular practice, deeply embedded in the Mongol military strategy. For the Mongols, these skull pyramids were more than just symbols of victory. They were tools of psychological warfare. By displaying the remains of their enemies in such a terrifying manner, the Mongols aimed to deter future resistance. The message was clear. Any city or army that opposed the Mongol horde would face not only defeat, but also a brutal and humiliating end. This tactic was highly effective, as many cities chose to surrender rather than face the wrath of the Mongols and the inevitable construction of another skull pyramid. Though undeniably creepy, this practice was considered normal in the Mongol Empire. All right, guys, it's time for our subscribers pick. This image you are looking at captures one of the many chilling practices that were considered normal in the Mongol Empire. The method depicted where a person is bound inside a wooden box with only their head exposed was a form of execution reserved for those who had committed grave offenses. While this method might seem particularly brutal and inhumane by today's standards, it was a reflection of the harsh realities of Mongol justice. This method wasn't exclusively reserved for women. Both men and women could face such a fate depending on the crime. Offenses like treason, severe disobedience, or betrayal could lead to such a gruesome end. Victims were often bound tightly, making escape impossible, and left to suffer a slow, agonizing death, fully exposed to the elements and any onlookers. While it seems shocking to us today, this kind of brutality was a powerful tool for instilling fear and obedience within the Mongol Empire. It raises questions about the fairness of such practices, challenging us to reflect on the extremes to which humanity has gone in enforcing power and control. Was this truly a necessary measure or simply a terrifying overreach? Share your thoughts in the comments section. Drinking horse blood. In the Mongol Empire, drinking horse blood was a common practice among soldiers, especially during long military campaigns when food supplies were scarce. This might sound gruesome and creepy by modern standards, but for the Mongols, it was a practical survival technique that was deeply embedded in their nomadic warrior culture. The Mongols were expert horsemen, and their horses were central to their way of life. 
These horses were incredibly hardy and could endure long distances and harsh conditions, making them indispensable in warfare. However, when the Mongol army found itself deep in enemy territory or in desolate landscapes with no access to food, the soldiers had to rely on their horses not just for transportation, but for sustenance. To extract the blood, a soldier would make a small incision in the vein of the horse's neck, usually with a sharp tool or knife. This cut was carefully done to avoid seriously injuring the animal, allowing the horse to continue serving its rider. The soldier would then drink the blood directly from the wound, using it as a source of nourishment. This blood was rich in nutrients and provided the Mongol warriors with the energy needed to continue their campaigns, often under extreme conditions. The horses were valued partners in battle, and their ability to sustain the soldiers in times of need further reinforced their importance. While the idea of drinking horse blood might seem unsettling today, it was considered a normal and necessary practice for the Mongols. It allowed them to survive in the harshest conditions, maintain their military advantage, and continue their conquests across vast stretches of land. Ritual Strangulation of the Nobles Unlike other citizens, the execution of high-ranking leaders and nobility was handled with a unique level of care and reverence, starkly different from the often brutal and public executions of common criminals or enemies. The Mongols believed that the blood of their leaders, especially those of noble lineage, was sacred. This belief shaped their approach to punishing those of high rank who had committed offenses worthy of death. Rather than subjecting these leaders to the same public executions that were common for others, the Mongols ensured that the blood of their elite remained unspilled, adhering to their cultural and spiritual beliefs. One of the most common methods of execution for high-ranking Mongol leaders was strangulation. This method was seen as a way to kill without shedding blood, preserving the sanctity of their lineage and the symbolic purity of their blood. Strangulation was often carried out in a private setting, away from the public eye, ensuring that the dignity of the individual, even in death, was maintained. Another approach was to place the condemned leader in a battle or a situation where they would inevitably face death, such as being surrounded by enemies or placed in an impossible combat scenario. In these cases, the leader would die in combat, a fate considered more honorable than public execution. Even though their death was orchestrated, it allowed the leader to maintain a semblance of their warrior status, dying in battle rather than being executed like a common criminal. The belief that Mongol leaders possessed sacred blood meant that their deaths had to be handled with care, ensuring that the blood remained unspilled and their dignity preserved. Nomadic Raiding and Kidnapping Nomadic raiding and kidnapping were central aspects of life in the Mongol Empire, particularly during the time of Genghis Khan and his successors. What might sound horrific and unsettling today was considered a normal and even strategic practice in the expansion of the Mongol Empire. When the Mongol armies swept through cities and villages, they did so with ferocity and precision. Their raids were not just about territorial expansion. They were also about capturing resources, including people. Women, in particular, were often targeted during these raids. Once a village or city was overrun, the Mongol warriors would assault the women, subjecting them to many forms of violence. This was not just an act of cruelty, but a calculated method to terrorize and demoralize the conquered populations. The women who survived these assaults were frequently taken as spoils of war, forced into servitude or concubinage, and assimilated into the Mongol ranks. The kidnapping of women was a common practice, and it served multiple purposes for the Mongols. It allowed them to integrate new bloodlines into their own, thereby expanding their influence and ensuring the continuation of their nomadic lineage. The women taken during raids were often compelled to marry their captors. These marriages were not based on mutual consent or respect, but were instead reflections of the Mongols' dominance and the subjugation of those they conquered. For the Mongols, this form of violence and domination was an accepted part of life. Their nomadic existence, driven by the need for constant movement and acquisition of resources, shaped their worldview and justified these brutal practices. To them, the kidnapping and raiding of women were simply strategies for survival and expansion. However, 
These acts left a lasting trauma and horror among the populations they subjugated. The use of plague as a weapon. The Mongol Empire, renowned for its military prowess and conquests, is also believed to have been one of the first powers to utilize biological weapons in warfare. Historical accounts suggest that the Mongols employed a form of biological warfare by using plagues as a weapon against their enemies. This method of spreading disease was not just an accident of history, but a deliberate strategy to weaken and decimate opposing forces and civilian populations. One of the most infamous examples of the Mongols' use of biological weapons occurred during the siege of the Crimean city of Kaffa, modern-day Theodosia, in 1346. The Mongol army, led by the Golden Horde, was besieging the city when an outbreak of the plague struck their camp. Recognizing the potential of this deadly disease as a weapon, the Mongols began to hurl the bodies of their plague-infected soldiers over the city walls using catapults. The rotting corpses spread the plague among the inhabitants of Kaffa, leading to a devastating outbreak that forced the city's defenders to surrender. This tactic was not just a random act of desperation, but part of a broader understanding among the Mongols of how disease could be weaponized. By spreading the plague, the Mongols were able to cause chaos and panic within enemy ranks, weakening their ability to resist. The impact of this biological warfare was profound, not only leading to the fall of Kaffa, but also contributing to the spread of the Black Death across Europe as infected individuals fled the city, carrying the disease with them. Their understanding of disease as a tool of war set a precedent for future conflicts and highlighted the terrifying potential of biological warfare. While the deliberate use of plague-infected corpses is one of the most well-documented instances, it is likely that the Mongols employed similar tactics in other sieges and battles making biological warfare a chilling aspect of their military strategy. And that's all for today. Thanks for watching.